I thought that um, <clears throat> that we'd go over, we went fairly quickly the last uh, couple sessions and uh, I want to make sure that, um, that we're all on the same page and we, we apply uh, some of the conversation that we had about assumptions and especially post enlightenment assumptions to the to the work that we're looking at <clears throat> i thought that i would um, show you one thing that um, is quite curious this is my mouse pad it's also the monier williams sanskrit english dictionary and uh, does it come out backwards on your screen or just on my screen? No, it's it's fine on on mine. Okay. Well, this is the this is the Sanskrit English dictionary that is used by just about everyone in the English language world and in some of the other languages as well as it's a, uh, a, a, a big dictionary, the best one that I know of in English. There are some in German that I think are perhaps better. But what I wanted to do is, is read you this uh, short paragraph in the preface to the new edition which was uh, written in 1899 at Oxford <laughs> University in England. Okay. Uh, this is on, uh, on, on page Roman numeral nine of the preface to the new edition. And he writes, <clears throat> in explanation I must draw attention to the fact that I am only the second occupant of the Bowdoin chair of Sanskrit and that its founder, Colonel Bowdoin, stated most explicitly in his will, dated August 15, 1811, that the special object of his munificent bequest was to promote the translation of the scriptures into Sanskrit so as to, quote, enable his countrymen to proceed in the conversion of the natives of India to the Christian religion. This is the dictionary. This is, this is what we have learned to uh, treat as the authority for words. When, when translators might translate uh, Patanjali, uh, they will look up in the dictionary for a particular word and they'll see a number of options before them and they will choose among the options uh, according to what fits uh, the, the sentence that they're writing in terms of their meaning, in terms of the sound of the sentence, in terms of the, the way that they like a particular word. And as we can see, that that authority is misplaced within the confines of an oral tradition. And this is, this is very much what we're dealing with in, um, in our conversation about sacred speech. The, the work of Panini, uh, in his Ashtajayi, last, last week we went over the Maheshwara Sutra and, um, and we could see how out of uh, a relatively small phonetic system, an entire language is, is manifested. In Panini's Ashtajayi, there are 4,000 sutras. Uh, out of these 4,000 sutras, not only is the entire Sanskrit language manifested, but 
starting in the 20th century in Europe and America, uh, certain mathematicians became interested in the connection between language, speech, and mathematics. And in fact, by 1940, there was a, uh, a mathematician by the name of uh, Emil Post, who very much influenced by Panini, he he uh, wrote to um, uh, um, he wrote about that, um, as well as another mathematician, Turing. They saw that in the formal system of Panini, which preceded formal systems of logic in Europe by perhaps 2,500 years, that there was a direct connection with mathematics. Emil Post went a step further and he took one of the basic attributes of uh, Panini's Sutra system and he devised a theory uh, that uh, is usually referred to as, um, what's it called? Um, um, oh, I forgot the name. Symbolic auxil auxiliary symbols, auxiliary symbols. And it's with this system of auxiliary sy symbols that the modern computer languages are all based. This was the key for the modern computer languages, was a, a means of endlessly generating speech, which is the, the, um, one of the genius elements of Panini's composition. So we're seeing here something that is actually beyond quote-unquote religious observances. It's beyond an ideology or a religion. Fritz Stahl, the eminent uh, Dutch Sanskritist, probably among the greatest of the Western Sanskritists of the 20th century, besides studying Panini as the, the, the great grammarian and the master of grammar, he called Panini India's Euclid. There is a connection between the geometry of sacrificial fire pits, of sacrificial altars, and in fact um, the entire setup of any Vedic ritual, which relates also directly to the mathematics implied as a formal system in the language, in the speech of Vedic ritual, uh, Vedic sacrifice. So here we have an area that the greatest minds in the history of the world, Panini, Patanjali, Pythagoras in, in, uh, in Greece and Sicily saw the connection between speech, mathematics, and music. Aristotle took off with the Pythagorean theories. And once Panini's composition reached the Europeans, in the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, the reading of Panini 
uh, is almost single-handedly responsible for the study, the modern study of speech and uh, the cognitive sciences, including linguistics. So this is, this is the area that we're dealing with. I find it especially curious that several of the mathematicians that have used the composition of uh, Panini to develop their mathematical theories have pointed out the necessity that Panini's composition is part of an oral tradition and is an oral composition. This, I believe, would also uh, uh, connect with Noam Chomsky's theories of, uh, of cognition and speech, in which uh, Chomsky claims that the language is not really learned uh, by the child from the parent, but inherent in the, in the DNA of, uh, of the child from birth. This has a, a correspondence with Bhartrihari's um, uh, exposition on speech in Vakyapadiya, where he describes speech as also being inherent in the, in the newborn infant, however, uh, not referring to DNA, but referring to previous births, incarnations, rebirth. So I wanted to, to give you that, that little um, uh, background to this huge subject that, um, that we are uh, dealing with here and um, to, to uh, uh, reassure you that if you're having any difficulties in, um, in understanding how I'm trying to take you into this speech, it's, it's very normal. We're, we're, we're having a conversation about one of the most difficult subjects uh, that, that I know of.